gives me uh, great pleasure uh, it's an honor to introduce to you our speaker uh, this afternoon. Dr. John Hobbins uh, is a graduate of University of Wisconsin-Madison, University of Toronto. He has studied at the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome and received his doctorate from Waldensian Theological Seminary in Rome. He is uh, a pastor, has worked uh, extensively uh, throughout the world in uh, aiding people in theological education and teaching Hebrew. He has published numerous articles uh, and academic works and most recently published uh, Genesis 1 to 11, a new old translation for readers, scholars, and translators, uh, co-authored with Samuel Bray. Uh, and he will be speaking to us this afternoon on uh, translating the Bible as scripture. So please give a very warm welcome to Dr. John Hobbins. Good afternoon. It's great to be here with you. I'm here because of a friendship that uh, Graham Summers, one of your illustrious graduates, uh, and I struck up um, because he was reading my blog, which I kept for many years, called Ancient Hebrew Poetry. You can still find it and was surprised, happily surprised, to see that some of you have been reading that blog as well. And I'm here to uh, speak to you about in making, to make a case for translating scripture as scripture. As you heard, um, uh, a friend of mine and I, his name is Samuel Bray, he teaches law now at Notre Dame University. And uh, between raising five children and, uh, and uh, being the leader of an Anglican New Church Start in Notre Dame and writing 80 page essays for the Harvard Law Review and Supreme Court briefs, he finds time to uh, help translate the Bible all over again in a way that, uh, as we look at it, appreciates and values scripture as scripture and seeks to carry over from uh, the Hebrew and when we do some Greek text from Greek as well, uh, something of not just the content, but also the form and artistry of the texts which make up uh, Holy Scripture for us. And I want to make a case for the method of translation that we have adopted, and I need to describe that. But uh, if you haven't seen it, this is the book that uh, we have published, and it's on Genesis 1 through 11, and we are uh, about halfway through the book of Genesis in terms of translation. We've also translated the book of Jonah. We have a draft translation, and I thought I would bring that along. So you have a copy of that, and if you know Hebrew, that will mean a little bit more to you. But even if you don't, if you read the English translation that we offer, you'll have a chance, and I won't be going through it, uh, in the next few minutes or during this lecture, but if you take some time with that, you'll get an idea of some of the things that we're trying to do. Uh, the, the translation that we are working on is meant to be read aloud. It's meant to have, uh, to be paced properly for uh, public uh, worship. It's meant to, to bring out some of the features of, um, of the Hebrew that are often overlooked, and so if the language uh, is uh, personifying, we try to bring that out. If uh, Sometimes we even, where the language, uh, Hebrew is a, is a gendered language, like uh, Spanish, if you know Spanish, so each noun is either feminine or masculine, and sometimes we will retain the gender of the, of the Hebrew into English where we think it can be carried over. So, for example, uh, the ark, in, in, in uh, uh, Noah and the flood, the ark is a she. And uh, the uh, boat uh, in, in, um, in, in Jonah that he's thrown, he's hurled from, is also a she. Uh, so these are just examples. I just wanted to give a couple, and so I encourage you to look that over. But what I'm going to do is talk more generally about translating scripture and scripture, the value of 
uh, knowing the original languages and uh, related subjects. So the translation project that, that uh, Sam and I are engaged in is born of love for the old translations. So you have a Tyndall library, and that's after the first translator of a good portion of the Bible. He translated the Pentateuch, Jonah, uh, and the New Testament. Uh, and a measure of disappointment that we have with the newer translations, we aim to be faithful in translation to the patterns of repetition in the original and the earthiness and simplicity of its diction. So whereas many translations, the newer translations, if a term is repeated in the Hebrew or Greek, uh, a newer translation will often vary the translation uh, so that it will seem, at least to some sensibilities, uh, not as monotonous. But we will preserve repetition uh, is insofar as it's possible, and then you start seeing connections that otherwise you would miss. The simplicity of a text, the diction Hebrew, if you've studied Hebrew, and I hope all of you will, if you haven't already, you'll discover it's a language that has a simplicity and earthiness about it, and how to carry that over into translation so it sounds as earthy and, and has that terrible simplicity in English that maybe in ordinary English style is not so common, so we try to do that. We also have a high regard for the church's reception of scripture and take that into account in our translation of scripture. So Sam and I, we both just subscribe to the Nicene Creed, and just as an example, and we let that impact the way we go about our work of translation. Uh, and when it comes to translating scripture as scripture, one element is that is that it's about cultivating a healthy relationship between scripture and tradition. So it's not by accident that I'm a confessional Lutheran, although, to be honest, I'm ordained in the Waldensian Church, which is a Reformed confession. So my confession of faith is about the same as the Gallican confession of faith, just so that you know that I'm here with family, <laughs> if that's uh, what your family is. And Sam is a confessional Anglican. That means we belong to creedal churches, and that means that we value a regular regula fide, a confession of faith that's derived from scripture and which serves as a guide to reading scripture and determines how one reads scripture in view of establishing faith and practice. So let me talk about that just a little bit more so you understand that when we translate scripture, we take into that account. So scripture in a creedal setting is a norma normans, that is, it is the norm which norms all other norms. Among those norms are rules of faith, uh, such as the Nicene Creed or the Augsburg Confession, and they are valued as norma normata, that is, norms normed by Scripture. You guys are following me, aren't you? <laughs> so translations produced by individuals or teams with a high view of Scripture and the Church have on vacation themselves become norma normata, normed norms in a subsidiary sense, vehicles by which the virtues of faith, hope, and love have vivified the people of God in Christ from age to age. And so uh, we think translation, if it is going to be a sacred task, will always be that very thing. And that means that the translations in English we treasure the most, that we admire, are chiefly the Tyndall Bible and the King James Version. Let it be said that it is Tyndall's pioneering work of close translation. He completed the Pentateuch, the book of Jonah, and the New Testament, as I mentioned before that stands behind, often word for word, the King James Version and subsequent revisions thereto. Nonetheless, neither Tyndall nor the committee King James appointed were as faithful to the wording of the original Hebrew and Greek as they might have been. So a comparison of our translation of Genesis 1 through 11 with those of Tyndall and King James over against the Hebrew will bear this out. In our, pu our published volume, if you like making comparisons with translations, uh, you'll enjoy reading the volume and you'll see that we make um, respectful comparisons with all previous translations, but we give special attention among English translations to Tyndall and King James. A formidable precursor to our project, nonetheless, is of a different kind, and that is uh, that of Robert Alter. So raise your hand if you've read any part of the 
Old Testament by Robert Alter. How many of you have done that? Quite a few, quite a few. So Robert Alter is a Jewish scholar. He teaches at uh, UC Berkeley in Com Comp Lit. Uh, he's written extensively in, in the fields of comparative literature, but he's also uh, an excellent Hebrew, uh, Hebraist from modern to medieval to ancient. And he took it upon himself to translate first the book of Genesis and then uh, uh, over 20, 25 years, the entire, he just finished, I think he's in his early 80s, the entire Tanakh, that is the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. And it's an amazing work. And uh, it came out in, in whole just last year uh, in three volumes. And there's a companion volume to that accomplishment that just came out too. It's called The Art of Bible Translation. So I thought I'd get, make a few remarks on that translation project. Agreements and disagreements are of equal interest. The first difference in approach to know is fundamental. Very intentionally, Alter's translation, which is also a close translation with a lot of attention to the literary artistry of the text, uh, with concordance in translation that is trying to be consistent and, and uh, uh, being a mimetic translation, trying to imitate various elements and components of the translation. He does all of that. But his is a fresh translation, and ours very intentionally is not. Ours, like that of the churchmen who produced the King James Version, is what you might call a new old translation, a revision of earlier translations. The King James Version, the KJV, is a revision of the Bishop's Bible. That was the latest in a series of revisions whose primary point of departure was the translation of Tyndall. David Trobish remarks, the first of the 15 rules handed to the committee members read, one, the ordinary Bible read in the church, commonly called the Bishop's Bible, to be followed and as little altered as the truth of the original will permit. So that was the first rule of translation that those who uh, translated the version of the Bible in English that we know as the King James Version followed, had to follow, and indeed they did follow. Now, they also paid a lot of attention to the Vulgate, and they knew the Greek very well, so they could compare it to the Septuagint, uh, as well as following the Hebrew and comparing the Hebrew also with medieval Jewish commentators. And all of these have turned out to be great strengths, reasons why the King James Version uh, as such, and then and with, um, with revisions there, too, has been... Uh, by far the most important stream of Bible translation in the English language. In the opening chapter of Alter's Art of Bible Translation, which he entitles The Eclipse of Bible Translation, uh, he speak, when he says eclipse, he means that after the King James and the older Bible translations, Bible translation as he sees it, and also as we see it, has gone downhill <laughs> in, in many ways. Uh, he speaks of the inspired literalism of the older translation and the woeful inadequacies of 20th century English translation. And he gives many examples of the inadequacies. Uh, and Sam Bray and I, we also have deep misgivings about the way English versions of the last 100 years translate key words, the original, with a bewildering variety of modern English equivalents. We too are convinced that the specifics of Hebrew syntax, Hebrew grammar, are best carried over into English where possible. And we too are convinced that the sound play and the word play and the rhythm and the compactness of the Hebrew are worth imitating where possible in English translation. Like Alter, we laud what he calls the inspired literalism of the Tyndall, Geneva, and King James translations. At the same time, we hold the older translations in the arc of reception history of the Bible in higher regard than Alter. The older translations in the entire arc of reception of the Bible are more in tune with the substance than Alter seems to think. That's why our translation is a new old translation, and his is a new translation. The terms, of course, are relatives. Now, let me give you a couple of examples. So, when it comes to translating nephesh, right? So, some of you are thinking Hebrew, you all have heard that word, nephesh. Now, Alter admits that it often actually means essential self. Now, you'd never use that phrase to translate nephesh. That's like, be a terrible translation. Uh, praise the Lord, O oh my essential self. You know. 
sick now. It, it does essential self is not a bad, um, you know, dictionary definition of what nefesh often means. Uh, okay, now we retain the traditional soul, right? Bless the Lord, O my soul. We know that phrase. Uh, wherever a translation in accord with the Hebrew word's literal meaning, okay, so nefesh has a literal meaning, and what is it? It's our breathing and food intake apparatus, throat, this area, almost the neck, but inside more. That's what it literally means. Uh, we're not going to translate it literally if that uh, literal meaning would be too limiting uh, in context, nor are we going to pick a modern sa sounding abstract equivalent like being because we consider that too off putting, too too disconnected with the history of the translation of, of the Bible into English. So, a case in point, I already mentioned it. Alter, how does he translate that famous phrase? Bless, O my being, the Lord, and everything in me, his holy name. Now, however exact in its own way, it lacks the sonority, right? Of We, we all know this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name, right? That's straight King James. So, O oh my soul. Now, the connection of the expression, O oh my soul, it occurs in many psalms, not just 103, 42, 43, 62, 103, three times, and 104, with the reception of that word, soul, in everything in our culture, from soul music to the soul mate to all souls church. You see, if you take that out and you put, bless the Lord, O oh my being, you sever the connection between the source of why we say All Souls Church and, and we, we talk about soul music if you translate it by being. Now it's still possible, we, so we think that soul is best retained in those cases uh, in the Psalms I just mentioned and many other places. Uh, it's possible though, and this is what we'll do, uh, to offer a new old translation, a translation that S retains the King James, Tyndall King James uh, translation tradition where possible, but also bring it closer to the wording of the Hebrew if, if that seems um, uh, advisable, if that seems like it can be done and still retain the sonority and poetry of the text. And we can do that with uh, this verse because, interestingly enough, so the 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 King James says, bless, o my, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within, within me, bless his holy name. But actually, bless does not occur twice in Hebrew. So that was an addition. So in our version, we would translate, bless, O my soul, the Lord, and all my inward parts, his holy name. So we retain a lot. Of, we don't, all that is, is within me is a beautiful phrase. The only trouble is it's not in the Hebrew. <laughs> it's not exactly what the Hebrew says. You, have, you don't have a relative clause, a nominalized clause like that, you have two nouns that are in stricter parallelism. So that's the kind of thing we try to do. In our translation, we want to preserve uh, as much as possible the, the, uh, the gains uh, and the uh, positive um, uh, approaches that we, we see in the positive choices, the brilliant choices that we see in the King James translation tradition but uh, bring, it, bring the translation closer to, revise it closer to the Hebrew um, where uh, we think that can be done uh, and it, that can be a plus. And if you know the history of the translation of the Bible in Greek, which began with original translation in each uh, translation unit of what we call the Old Testament when it was translated into Greek, we now refer as, as the Old Greek or the Septuagint, uh, then there were translators that came later that revised it in a variety of ways. So what we're doing is something that's been going on among uh, believers uh, uh, in many shapes and form over the centuries. Now in the book of Jonah, you have that in front of you. Nephesh occurs twice, each with its little, literal meaning of throat. So if you look at the translation I gave you, look at chapter two, verses six and eight, um, you'll see how we translate uh, nephesh in that case. We don't actually translate it as throat, but it has a literal meaning, and so we don't translate it as soul. 
Um, our translation and that of altar gloss nephesh into six with neck, okay? So that refers to nephesh in a literal sense, but water is said to come up to one's neck in English, right? That's how we say it. We don't say water comes up to our throat. So we have uh, neck instead of throat there. Um, but throat really isn't any more or less literal than neck. Uh, it's just that anatomical terms in every language have a, have a, have a range of meaning that they just do not cross, can't be mapped onto another language one-on-one -on -one at all. There's usually uh, some overlap, and that's all. And then in 2.8, both our trans translation and altar gloss nephesh with breath and life breath. He says life breath. We just say breath in 2, verse 8. Uh, since in English it is breath that is said to grow faint, not the throat or breathing apparatus. Uh, that's what is meant, the breathing apparatus, which becomes unable to breathe well any longer. Uh, so you see what we're doing. We're trying to preserve, we're not going to translate soul there, um, which some other translators might have done. Uh, we are going to stick with the literal meaning if the meaning retains its literalness in the original. Uh, but we're going to be flexible so that uh, it sounds um, it sounds Oh, it sounds reasonable in English. So this is what Alter calls the idiomatic integrity of the co target language. So at the expense of perfect consistency, uh, if the idiomatic integrity of the target language is respected, you are not going to be able to be perfectly consistent. You're not going to be able to translate nephish, for example, is throat um, everywhere you find it, or is soul everywhere you find it. Uh, just giving you an idea of what happens when you start try to try to translate Hebrew into English. Now a more interesting case still is where is how Alter avoids translating the noun uh, uh, Yesh Yeshua, right? Yeshua, you've heard that term before. <laughs> Yeshua. Uh, and associated verb forms, so it occurs in the Hethio, Moshia, and then there's a the noun Moshia, with English salvation, savior, and save. He won't do that. Remember, he wants to have a fresh translation. And so in Jonah 2.10, where you have Yeshuata Ladonai, if I remember correctly, he has rescue is the Lord's. It reads, salvation is of the Lord in our translation. And why do we do that? Okay, it is the case, you see, that salvation, Savior, and save are words with broad shoulders, as it were, able to carry the weight of political and theological discourse, not just mundane conversation. So there are a number of translations, and even a fresh translation like Alter, he should know better, I, I think, but he has sort of an adversity to theological terms. Um, it just doesn't make sense to translate the Bible in, at the same level of discourse, the same register, if you wish, as you and I speak if we're on Twitter, or if we're having a conversation at Starbucks, uh, or uh, even in the classroom. We need to aim for, it turns out in most cases, there are exceptions, a higher literary register in order to carry uh, theological and political terms of deep significance. So when the first translation of the Torah in into Greek was done, and Greek was the culture language of the Oikumene, the inhabited world of Greek-speaking world, for a thousand years, it carried over the set of words with a similarly imposing set of Greek words. So if you know Greek at all, you know that soteria, soter, sotsin. These are words that have, they can be used in a political context, they can be used in a theological context, a philosophical context, not just a military context of delivery or rescue. And so the Greek terms then in Latin become salus, salvator, and salvare, and salvation, savior, and save in English. So you can break with this tradition, and it's surprising, not just Alter, but a number of contemporary translations will break with this. But this break is not a break 
in just a religious in nature. It's also a cultural and literary amputation. It severs a connection with much more than, uh, uh, say, Christian orthodoxy or Christian theology. Much, much more. In fact, despite all that, it beggars the imagination to think that theologically fraught, those are his terms, equivalent of words like nefesh and yeshua are to be avoided in a translation of literature as theologically fraught as that of the Bible. Attention to ancient precedent has advantages. I'll give you an example. So the claim we find in the calendar inscription of Pravin, that Providence sent Caesar Augustus, quote, as a savior, both for us and for our descendants, that he might end war and set things in order. Now, that, of course, that claim is up for debate. And the same holds true for the angelic words reported uh, in the Gospel of Luke, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Okay, so in English, the words uh, so there become, become Savior. It just doesn't make sense to replace a term like savior with a less ample term like deliverer or rescuer in these and similar contexts. Any more than it makes sense, uh, Dr. X is gonna agree with me, are we gonna say, we're not gonna say God save the queen anymore, we're gonna say God rescue the queen? It doesn't work, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So, so if we're gonna say God save the queen, we better have not just a deliverer and rescuer, there are other verbs, by the way, there's so many verbs of saving in the Bible. We just read, we just sung a beautiful song from Psalm 119. And you have, uh, for lihatzil, you have rescue, but when you have uh, Yeshua, uh, you have salvation. That's a, because the translation on which this hymn is based is in the King James translation tradition. So those terms are, are preserved. And as you notice, the King James Version goes back, it harks back to translation choices made in the Vulgate and before that in the Septuagint. So what does that mean? To translate scripture as scripture means that we value uh, the way that uh, the Old Testament, the books of the Bible in Hebrew have been translated by believers over the centuries and over the millennia. We take that seriously. It doesn't mean we have to uh, follow every choice, but that we understand we, we seek to understand why those choices were made and we look at them, uh, if anything, with uh, an, a, a bias in favor rather than the opposite. Now Alter takes aim at what he calls re relentlessly etymo etymological translations and there's one co-authored by Martin Buger and Franz Bosenweig in German. I actually enjoy reading to that but it's very very unusual translation. You can always learn something. There's a translation by an American Everett Fox that is in the same tradition. Maybe some of you have read. Uh, and that's where every Hebrew word, you know, Hebrew words are uh, even names, they all have a meaning. Uh, and so you can bring out those meanings. Uh, let's, let's say, uh, and I'll give this example in greater detail, but there's a verb, zavach, which means to slaughter. And so you can slaughter uh, an animal and offer it in the meat market, but more often in the Bible, slaughter is where you offer a sacrifice. You slaughter an animal, then you offer it for sacrifice. And a mizbeach is not really a chopping block. It's a place where you offer, it's an altar is how it's usually translated. So uh, I think it might have been changed because it was just so jarring, but Everett Fox translated it something like, uh, uh, rather than altar, he had um, uh, place of slaughter, or something like that. Um, that's a little bit too much, even though etymologically is correct. But these are the things that uh, we, we deal with if we're translation, if we're working in translation. So what we do, for example, for Zavach, Zavach, and Mizbeach, uh, these cluster of words that are associated with slaughter, if the ritual slaughter of animals, parts of which might be eaten by worshipers, parts of which might be offered to the deity. Um, we will translate with slaughter uh, if the sense of offering and sacrifice is nonetheless clear from the context. Otherwise, we will also paraphrase. 
if there's a cognate accusative expression in Hebrew, that's where you use both the verb and the noun together. And sometimes it might be translated sacrifice, sacrifices, but we, um, more often it would be translated offer sacrifices because cognate accusatives, we say I dream, I dreamed a dream. We can do that in English, but it's a little bit more jarring to the ear in many situations than it is, say, in Hebrew. We translate, say, slaughter a sacrifice uh, in order to bring out both elements. But we think it's important to bring out the literal, physical component of the act that is referenced wherever possible. And so also make sure that the reference, the sort of contextual reference to sacrifice and altar is also clear in context. Now I also want to clarify why I think it's important to go back to the Hebrew and what we should mean when we say scripture and what I mean when I uh, use terms like close and faithful translation. So why is it important to go back to the Hebrew? This summer I will be going with, with, with Graham and, and uh, another student, a uh, divinity student from Princeton University, will be going to teach a Hebrew intensive to South Sudanese Lutheran pastors and evangel evangelists on the edge of a war zone in Ethiopia. So there's a half a million refugees that spilled over the border and are in a safe place uh, in Ethiopia. There's a civil war going on in South Sudan. Now, the Lutheran Church of South Sudan, interestingly enough, requires all of its pastors to learn Hebrew and Greek. And this follows uh, the advice of Martin Luther. And I give you in the handout some relevant quotes. I'm not going to read the, the Latin for you, but I give you the Latin because the Latin, if you know it, is always better to read any text in the original if you can. But what Luther points out, he says, the Greeks express themselves with the best and most delightful words, but the Hebrew language shines with such simplicity and majesty that it cannot be imitated. So he's praising uh, the... Hebrew language. Then uh, the next quote is interesting, and, and those of you who have taken Hebrew and hated it will agree with what he has to say. He says, the Hebrew language is held of little account because of a lack of uh, dutifulness. Um, or that's not a good translation of Latin. I don't know why I have that there. Um, yeah, the uh, or pe perhaps out of despair at its difficulty. Yeah, okay. Uh, how is that in the Latin? Disperazione, artis. <laughs> so maybe you feel like it, it causes despair at its difficulty. But what he says is, without this language, there can be no understanding of Scripture. For the selfsame New Testament, though written in Greek, is full of Hebraisms. And therefore, it's been correctly said. I don't know where he got this, but it's just beautiful. He says, the Jews drink from springs from ex fontibus, the Greeks from rivulets, and the Latins, the Romans, ex lacunas, from puddles. <laughs> Amen. 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 That's all right. See, I'm, the dean and I get along just fine. So. All right. So now, what does it mean to translate scripture as scripture? Scripture surely is a mini splendid thing. And but at the very least, a high view of scripture um, means that we will, uh, we will seek to keep in mind what the purpose of scripture is as such. And I have a quote here from, from Zwingli that, uh, now Zwingli isn't my favorite reformer, don't get me wrong. But um, nonetheless, this is well written. The German just is great. I think I will read the German because it's so much fun. Uh, and then I'll read it in English. Endlich damit wir aufhören, einen jeden auf die alle Einwürfe wieder eine Antwort geben zu wollen, so ist das unsere Meinung, dass das Wort Gottes von uns in höchsten Ehren gehalten werden soll. Unter Gottes Wort ist allein das zu verstehen, was von Geister Gottes kommt. Und keinen Wort soll solcher Glaube geschenkt werden wie diesem. Denn das ist gewiss, Wenn es kann nicht fehlen, es ist klar, lasst uns nicht in der Finsternis irre gehen. Es lehrt sich selber, erklärt sich selber und erleuchtet die menschliche Seele mit allem Heil, in aller Gnade. Mag sie getrost in Gott, demütigt sie, dass sie sich selber verliert, ja wegwirft und davor Gott in sich fasst. In ihm lebt sie, zu ihm strebt sie. Verzweifelt an allen 
Kreaturen in Gott allein in, ist ihr Trost in ihr Zuversicht. Ohne ihn hat sie keine Ruhe. In ihm ruht sie allein. Finally, we conclude in the hopes of giving an answer to all to one and all objections. This is our understanding that the word of God is to be held by us in the highest honor. By the word of God is alone meant what comes from God's spirit, and no word should be accorded the same faith as this one. For it is certain, it cannot err. It is clear, it does not let us go errant in the darkness. It is its own interpreter and enlightens the human soul with all salvation in grace, makes it the that is the soul confident in God, humbles it so that it abandons and throws away its pretensions and places itself in God's hands. In it, it lives, uh, toward it, it turns, it doubts all creatures, and God alone is its trust and security. Without it, it has no rest, and in it alone, it rests. Okay, isn't that beautiful? So if that is our view of scripture, and it needs to be if we're going to translate scripture as scripture, then uh, it means that uh, we are going to translate scripture with a view that can serve all of those purposes. Now I think also that to translate scripture, scripture means that we have a high view of the church against which, as Jesus promises, the gates of hell will not prevail is the word of God <clears throat> as received and preserved and interpreted by the one holy Catholic and apostolic church um, that cannot and will not lead us into error. Not the word of God interpreted by the light of reason. So this morning, a group of students and I <clears throat> spent a couple hours studying the opening prophetic speech of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 to 20. We did not end with a survey of that text reception in Jewish and Christian faith and practice. We began with a survey of that reception. And that sort of turns things upside down, but maybe that's what we need to do. If we're going to read scripture as scripture, we're going to have to turn the way we read scripture upside down. Let us first have a clear understanding of the way a particular text has shaped the faith and practice of believers from age to age. Let us first have a clear understanding of how church and synagogue have understood, understood that particular scripture, how they have honored and obeyed it. Let us next have a clear understanding of scripture as a whole and, and other specific scripture, scriptures interpret a particular scripture that we have in hand. Only then are we in the best position to circle back and to start over and let the scripture at hand interpret scripture as a whole and other specific scriptures. Only then are we in a position to let the scripture at hand be received with honor and respect by the church militant of our day. Did you catch what I'm doing here? Kind of re re reversing. So if you read any commentary, it's going to start with that particular text and try to get to the bottom of it and, and get to every single detail. But it will leave out of the picture, way in the background. You can't even see it or even over against uh, the rest of scripture or the tradition of interpretation of the church. What if instead we put in focus the text um, from the start in its full context throughout the, the centuries? Look at that first, and then focus down uh, as, a, as a next step to that particular text. Put the focus and get out of focus the rest, and then bring back. You see how that's a different way of doing it? You won't see a commentary written yet the way I just described. And yet it might be a very good way to recover what I think is really important that we learn once again to uh, read scripture as scripture, and in, in our case also to translate scripture as scripture. So it'll always be the case. Uh, be the case. Thanks be to God that there are that there will be those who love the Word of God and will read it in the original language, languages. But of course, um, we will all continue to read the Word in translation, and some of us will only read the Word in translation. And if that's what we have to do. I'm going to quote from Anthony Pym now. Uh, it's a good idea to read a translation that is a resolutely, what he calls a resolutely non-superficial version. And another way I would describe it is a modest translation. 
which finishes very much in media res, is the term that Anthony Kim uses. And let me give you the full quote. Let's see. I'm hoping that you can make sense of it. If, and you, if you can't, just ask some questions in the Q&A. He says this, a text that is clear and readily, readily applicable avoids many communicative risks and can thus be find rewards in the short term. So a text that is clear and readily applicable, those are dynamic equivalent translations. The Good News Bible or um, uh, the Living, what's that called, the Living Translation. There's several out there. Um, on the other hand, a text that is dialectically abstruse, I find that phrase dialectically abstruse, so I'm not even going to try to explain what he's saying there, but um, a text that is dialectically abstruse and resolutely non-superficial runs a severe risk of not being understood in the short term. It finishes very much in media race, but it has the potential to produce re rewards over vast stretches of space and time, wherever and whenever loyalty to learning as a vocation survives. Sorry, we, academics can be long-winded. I had to, you know, cut and paste and uh, chop things down a little bit, but I hope you can get the sense of it. That is a translation that is a close translation is not going to be as easy to read. It's not an easy read. Uh, it's going to require effort, and uh, you will have to learn new things. But the rewards are great. That's his point. He also uh, uh, talks about Turi's Law. Gideon Turi is a, a theorist of translation. I was glad to hear that he's an author that is read in one of your graduate seminars. I think he's a great author. Um, and uh, that is also just very important, his writings about this. I won't go into that in greater detail now, but I would say that the Bible is a resolutely non-superficial text. It has layers, it has depth. It can be read at one more than level, and it's meant to be more than read at one more than one level. A close and faithful translation of it will also be resolutely non-superficial. It will be taxing on a contemporary reader in ways that it is not, it was not for its original readers, that's true but is a classic case of no pain, no gain. Now, another point I'll make is that uh, form and content together convey meaning. You can't really separate one from the other without great loss. And that being the case, it is essential to pay attention to both. And uh, I have two quotes, a number of quotes from two modern translations of the Russian classics. I think I have time really just for one. Uh, and this is what they have to say. They, they have produced a close, what I would call, and what they call a close translation of classics like uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace or Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov, and uh, their translation has been highly acclaimed, but it is not an idiomatic translation, and this is what they say. It is often said that a good translation is one that does not feel like a translation, one that reads smoothly in idiomatic English. But who determines the standard of the idiomatic? And why should it be applied to something so ideolectic as a great work of literature? Is Melville idiomatic? Is Faulkner? Is, Beck is Beckett? Those who raise the question of the idiomatic in translation do not seem to realize that they are imposing their own often very narrow limits on the original. A translator who turns a great original into a patchwork of ready-made contemporary phrases with no regard for its particular tone, rhythm, or character and claims this is how Tolstoy would have written today in English betrays both English and Tolstoy. We all know in the case of War and Peace that we are reading a 19th century Russian novel. The fact allows a 21st century translator a different range of possibilities that, than may exist for a 20th first century writer. It allows for the enrichment of the translator's own language rather than the imposition of his language on the original. So short and sweet, close and faithful translation of the sort uh, Richard PVR and Larissa Volansky, these two translators, of Russian classics, aim for, that's also worth aiming for in the rendering of the mother of all classics, the book we term 
the Holy Bible or sacred scriptures. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hobbins. It's, there is, I have to be very disciplined. There's a lot to talk about. Um, here's, here's, a, here's a question for you. Uh, would, when I read Thomas More and Tyndale's letters to one another and debates about translation and Tyndale's translation and the changes he makes. Um, I'm struck, and I, and the, and I listen to your uh, theory of translation, which is uh, very interesting and stimulating, and the, the conscious decision to be old, new, and being part of the tradition of the church and uh, the rule of faith. Would Tyndale have done his translation, would the Reformation have happened if they had have translated in that way? Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? So how do you deal with, you know, your, Tyndale is a sort of a, not a hero of yours, but he, you, know, you respect him, yet he broke with tradition. Yes. So how do, you, how do you work through that? So um, uh, it's true that, that uh, uh, Tyndale, more than the King James Version, uh, Tyndall worked more exclusively with the Hebrew, and that's all, than uh, was the case with the King James Version. Um, uh, what's interesting is that the King James Version was able to take over the work that Tyndale had done to a very large extent and st at the same time pay attention uh, to uh, and, and make um, uh, makes translation choices that kept um, our understanding of the words of scripture uh, in harmony with uh, the church's understanding of those same words, or just to use the same words, but already that we find in the Septuagint and then in Jerome's Vulgate, and also to pay attention to um, the history of interpretation, including Jewish interpretation, which was not necessarily a given. Um, Tino was not able, even if you wanted to, to draw on those sources. And so uh, you make a good point that there is a difference between Tyndall and uh, King James. And so um, we follow in, in uh, the Tyndall King James tradition, including the King James as opposed to apart from it. Yeah, but Jerome made mistakes, didn't he? He certainly did. He also had uh, a very sharp tongue. And if you ever read him, he's going to go, whoa, this guy. <laughs> Where are the fruits of the spirit half the time? <laughs> but um, he, was, he was a troublemaker. But he, he, was, um, he made mistakes. And, and, uh, um, and of course, so do we. We just don't know what they are. If we did, we'd get rid of them. But um, that's how translation is. It's not. A, um, it's always going to be an imperfect enterprise. Some of his mistakes come from uh, holding on to tradition and teachings of the church over and against the, the language of the texts he's translating. And um, I, I'm assuming in those situations, you go, no, you go with, you know, it's not penance. That's right, that's right, yeah. It wouldn't be penance. Um, uh, it's, uh, um, so there, there's, there's challenging choices to make along the way. Here's one that, um, that uh, we haven't got that far, so I, we haven't made any final decision, but I know what I, I tend to. So everyone knows Psalm 23, some of you know it by heart, and you know how it ends, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, right? It doesn't what the Hebrew says. It says, I shall dwell in the house for a, a long time, a length of days. Uh, and the reason already, I believe, in the Septuagint, uh, and then also just ge in general in uh, Jewish tradition, it's not by accident. I think there's enough evidence to say that is pre-Christian as well in Jewish tradition. Psalm 23 was adopted at funerals and was read in light of the 
of the belief in resurrection. And so even though the, the exact language of the text of Psalm 23 um, does not um, necessarily uh, imply uh, life after death, that's the way that the text has been uh, interpreted and translated, I think, since the Septuagint on. And um, uh, so to change that, uh, to limit it to something for a long time and not allow the text to continue to speak to the people of God as it has for centuries. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and to interpret that also in light of life and death and life after death, um, I think we'll end up going with tradition rather than simply what you could say, well, the text could be uh, much more limiting than that. Yeah. So Kugel famously, for his, in his book poems of the Hebrew Scriptures, Psalm 23, he just said, read the King James. <laughs> you know, he says, you, it's not so close to the Hebrew, but it can't be improved on in terms of its grandeur and beauty. And, and here the King James is not innovating. It's no. not, it wasn't the first to, to translate forever. Um, it's part of a way that the text has been read. And you have to decide at a certain point whether in a case like this you believe the Holy Spirit has been at work, not simply in um, the, the, author the author's work, but also in the work of uh, those who have been listening through the centuries. I know that's always difficult. Where, where do you stop? Where do you end? But... Uh, when we say in the Nicene Creed, bestium and ace, not just bestium and ace in Jesus Christ, but also in the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, what does that mean in reality and how does that apply? I don't necessarily have all the answers, but it's a good question to ask even when you're translating and you are trying to, to decide how much weight you're going to give to uh, uh, the, the interpretation of a particular passage uh, over the centuries. You know, and obviously I might, won't go into it, but Isaiah 714 is the one that will come up over and again. You know, a virgin shall give birth, right? The Hebrew, that's not necessarily the way you'd, in, you'd naturally translate that, but it's the way it was translated already by the Septuagint. Time to ask you Psalm 23, do you go, surely truth which we shall follow or pursue? When you go follow or pursue, yeah, that's right. Which one are you going to do? Yeah. Everyone says follow me, but the, the Hebrew feels a bit stronger, doesn't it? It does, it does, yeah. Yeah, I would like the stronger, that's like right. the stronger. You'd like yeah. to be pursued by... Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. you know, uh, that's the Calvinist in me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, the, uh, I should, I'll, I'll be disciplined. You can have your turn in a minute. Um... The pin quote, which is very, uh, very interesting, I, I enjoyed that a lot. But you also, you also have in your, as one of your, if I remember rightly from reading it, readability is, and and the and in terms of public reading, yes, is a translation uh. style requirement. How does that marry with the um, non-superficial? Resolutely non-superficial. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's like squaring a, a circle. Or that is, yeah. That's, that's, yeah, so th sometimes translation principles, and, I, and we're aware of this, are, are really in tension with one another, and yet they're both important. So uh, how do you produce a text that is, is um, that reads well, but is also um, bumpy at the same time? Well, part of it has to do with learning how to read better. So let's take from the New Testament, um, uh, Paul, let's say you're reading Galatians or Romans. So, by the way, if you read them in Greek, it's just as hard to follow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he gets excited, right? And his, um, his argument and structure is like, woo, 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 like that. And so in, in translation, you have a choice. You can smooth that out. Uh, you can eliminate some of the bumpiness, um, but um, maybe not. Maybe what you want to do is somehow bring it alive and, um, and for, for the bumpiness to be preserved. So it's going to be harder to read. Now, 
Is it gonna, if you read it in public, are you gonna understand it if it's bumpy like that? Well, I think you can. I mean, we struggle with our president when he talks, right? <laughs> it's a different kind of Did convolution. Did you just compare the Apostle Paul? No, no, no it's a <laughs> different kind of convolution as a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Different ways of being convoluted. Okay. But, um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> So we, if you have someone, I, I notice this as a pastor, um, normally in the churches I've served, we've been using the uh, ESV, which is a revision, of course, of RSV, and RSV is a revision of the King James Version. Um, but once in a while, I would have someone in my church who was an English professor, and she would say, can I read in the King James Version? And normally if someone told me, they asked me to do that, I would not allow them to because most people aren't good enough readers. But if you really know how to read well, you can read the King James and people will understand it. Uh, but you have to be very good at pacing uh, the way that you are speaking and maybe you have to explain a couple of words before you start and so on. But um, uh, so, um, yeah, those, those two translation principles are intention. Uh, and uh, in the end, we, we, want to, we want to be faithful to the stylistic choices of the original. So if the text is a diatribe and has convoluted arguments, then they should be convoluted in, <laughs> in English as well. And we'll do this in, in Genesis. There's even a couple of cases where it really looks like the text, uh, as we have it in Masoretic text, is missing something, let's say. And uh, many translations will uh, fill in the gap some way. We won't. We'll leave you with the same abruptness that is in the original. There aren't many cases like that. They're really quite rare and, and few and far between. But there are a few. And I think it's wise to include them and then to talk about them in the commentary. OK. Um, i go with Anita on that side. I promise to look over this side at some point, but I know I... So Anita, and then it's going to be Bobby after that, Daniel, okay? So Anita, back right, then Bobby. So I'm curious, when you're translating the Psalms, what is the value of sticking to a more literal translation of a phrase, so like in Psalm 103, all my inward parts versus all that is within me. And so focusing more on like the meaning or the content versus, versus focusing on communicating the form of it. So like this is Hebrew poetry. Should we try to make it sound poetic in our English translation and say something like all that dwells within me? So that's a very good question. In, in this particular example, it's not easy to decide what to do because all that is within me is such a beautiful phrase. Um, the reason why uh, we're choosing to go with soul in parallelism with all my inward parts is it's a common, what's known as a trope, a, a way that uh, Hebrew poetry works. You have one term, and then you have it repeated in the next half line uh, with a synonym, or not necessarily like one word, but uh, in this case, it is one word in Hebrew that uh, shares a number of features, often the same grammar uh, and so forth. So my soul uh, is in parallelism with my inward parts in the Hebrew. Now, you can change that to all that is within me if you want, but strictly speaking, that's a para paraphrase. Understand? And uh, you c there, there are times when a paraphrase is 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 necessary. But what if it isn't necessary? In this case, I don't think it is necessary. And so then the other question is where there are a few other cases where you have this parallelism, soul, my inward parts. And uh, in a case like this, when, when a translation begins to paraphrase, and King James, by the way, paraphrases relatively less often, it tends to be inconsistent as well. That is, on one occasion it will paraphrase, and on another occasion it won't. And then that has another uh, negative 
side to it, that means you can no longer see the connection, right, between the two passages. Because if it, in one place it's all that is within me, in the other place it's something close to my inward parts, then uh, you don't see that, see that the terminology is the same. So um, there is an advantage if you, if you reduce paraphrase and then translate, in this case, a phrase, things cure by um, my inward parts the same way. Uh, maybe in all occasions or as close as all occasions as possible. Does that help? Okay. Well, be. So, sort of a technical question, but one that I hope would highlight some of your principles. In, in verse 3 of chapter 1 on Jonah, in your translation, you have, And Jonah rose, but to flee to Tarsh Tarshish away from the face of the Lord. So the Hebrew doesn't have a word for but there. And it would seem you put that in there to make it read better in English. That's Could right. That's, a that's a, an example where we go against our own principles. That we, you know, normally we would not do that. And um, my conviction is that in Hebrew, the way that this, that same sense would have been drawn out is simply by intonation, by the sort of emphasis you put on the words. Now, one possibility is to leave the, the English without but as well in hope that people will just understand the text well enough to uh, intone the phrase in such a way that this, this contrast, so to speak, this surprise that's going on is somehow uh, brought out by the inflection of the voice, right? So that's one possibility. We, we chose, which is unusual for us, to make it explicit in the text. So that's a very good observation, and you won't see that often in what we do, but occasionally we do do that, and it's what we normally are arguing against. <laughs> Who would be a translator? <laughs> you have all these principles, and suddenly the text throws things at you. Uh, uh, back over there, Benjamin, and then across to Luke back on this side. So Benjamin there, and then Luke. Over there, we're making a run, Daniel. So you mentioned uh, Everett Fox. In his translation, if there's a phrase that he's concerned about trying to find an English equivalent of, he'll often just put it as a, as a dashed phrase, uh, several words with a dash in English, but not really trying to give some sort of equivalent have you ever found that uh, that's justified or that you ought to do that? His goal, he says, is just to leave it there and the reader can do with that as, as he sees fit as he keeps reading. Um, have you ever found occasion for that in your own translation? Uh, not with dashes in that sort of thing, but sometimes we'll do with a word play, we'll do a double translation. That is, we'll give one word two glosses. Uh, in order to bring, um, bring out a wordplay that's going on. That's unusual though too. There's most of the time, wordplay in Hebrew is just not able to be carried over, but uh, on occasion it just seems important enough that we'll try to do so. Uh, what Everett Fox is doing, nonetheless, can be very illuminating. And I would say the same thing about a lot of paraphrases um, that are out there, even in a, a translation that most of the time I'm wincing at a lot, like uh, Eugene Peterson's The Message. Uh, nonetheless, if I'm honest, sometimes I, gee, I never understood that passage. Now I do. <laughs> you know, and that's the way it is. I, 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 so I, this is my, my thought about that with um, etymolog etymological translation or with paraphrases. They have a place. But for me, they have a place, I'm a pastor, in my preaching. Because if I preach a text, I paraphrase it 10 times over, right? I bring out, bring out maybe I'll etymologize. Maybe I'll do all kinds of crazy linguistic things with that text, um, just so that that text becomes alive for my hearers. So I'm all in favor of doing that. But in terms of a translation to be read and pondered um, and reflected upon and prayed over in in worship and private devotion. I want a translation that's more modest than that. It doesn't try to hit a, hit a home run <laughs> with every translation. It'd be so wonderfully idiomatic. 
but to um, to hit, go to first base over and over again. Just uh, just bring out as much of that of the text in a simple, straightforward way as possible. And sometimes it won't be as pretty or as polished, but it can grow on you. And a lot of the passages in the Bible that really speak to us, uh, that have come down to us from Tyndall and King James, they're not necessarily all that pretty when you think about it in English, but they've over time they've grown on an entire culture. And, uh, and their simplicity has become something very beautiful. So if we can continue to do that, it's, this translation will always be an ongoing project of the people of God, not just in our language, but in every language. What's interesting is that throughout the world, there's just a history of Bible translation, and often the first translation into uh, a language uh, of any kind will be uh, filled with mistakes and wooden often and and just kind of all over the map. And then maybe later you get a dynamic equivalence translation. And then often what's happening now, it's true in German. German's a good example. So there are lots of modern German translations and then people got sick of it and they went back and revised Luther again and tried to update Luther. And then the Swiss revised the Zurich Bible. And that's a fascinating new translation too, but it, it's an, once again a close translation. In many of the important culture languages around the world, the newer translations are, that are out are no longer based on simply how can we translate the Bible into, into the vernacular in, in uh, language that people use every day, but are much more attentive to um, the way that uh, uh, that Holy Scripture is, is working within the church and so uh, Maybe the terms are sometimes sound archaic because that's terms that we use in our hymns and in our literature. And so you have a continuity then that is, that is retained, that keeps um, a conversation going over centuries. If you're constantly making uh, the language of the Bible uh, fresh, and then uh, it's not even gonna work uh, a generation later. So what about having a translation that is as that endures um, with uh, uh, with a little bit has a longer shelf life than than just uh, a generation. Yeah. Luke, you uh, mentioned at the beginning the um, earthiness of the Hebrew language, the simplicity that it has, and then uh, I think a bit later on you mentioned the necessity of trying to bring. Uh, the, the more deeper, the weightier theological concepts out with a uh, bit more of an elevated register, I think you said. How do you balance the uh, simplicity with the weightiness without it being too jarring? Yeah, that's a good point because that's another example where you have, have two principles that uh, are not repetitions of one another. They catch different facets of of uh, how Hebrew expresses uh, the truths that it does. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, there's, there's a simplicity in, in Hebrew in the, the stock of a vocabulary is, is relatively limited. Uh, the grammar is simple. The, there's not as much, uh, in linguistic terms, hypotaxis. That's where you have subordination. You have a lot of Parataxis, that's where you have and, and, and. Uh, and so we preserve those kinds of things. When it comes to uh, theological terms, and this of course is part of a, a greater debate, it's also in the New Tes Testament, you do have some technical terms uh, uh, also. You know, the famous ones that are always debated are things like propitiation or atonement and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, these words don't, have uh, th their, their technical terms, they were already in antiquity. So it's not as if everyone was talking about um, using these words in a variety of different semantic contexts. Uh, they were used in very specific ones. So in that case, um, we, we stick with uh, the technical 
we, we're, we try to be as technical as the Hebrew is technical. With theological terms like the examples that I gave, um, Nefesh and Yeshua, um, yeah, uh, we, uh, we, with Nefesh it's a fairly easy call, really, um, to be as earthy as the language is wherever possible when the, the reference is to what Alter calls the essential self to use the word soul. It's not that difficult to make those choices. <coughs> With the case of salvation, there are many cases where Yeshua uh, is very close to deliverance, and deliverance is a wonderful word. But there are other Hebrew words that um, one can translate with deliverance and, uh, and other words still with rescue. So since there are so many, we just sort of uh, try to divvy them up, so to speak, and be as consistent as we can so that you can start seeing, because repetends in, in a specific literary unit are very important. You start eliminating them, and most modern translations do, that is the, uh, something that's a repetend, something that's deliberately repeated. It's like a, in German, a Leitwort, a word that just sort of creates a red thread uh, through sometimes many chapters. If you vary the translation, there's just no way you're going to see it. And it's not always easy to, to maintain it, but it's if you make a conscious effort of doing so, of, of maintaining the repetence, uh, it uh, uh, it can add a lot. It can increase one's ability to capture the sense of the, of the text. I think very significantly. So that's something that we work on. Um, well, we're out of time. I'm sorry. It's 25 past. Just about to turn. So. Uh, please thank Dr. Hobbins with me. For <laughs>